It's no secret, education is the key to success. Serving more than 2,200 families, WQLN brings learning to life by combining PBS Kids programs with reading and hands-on activities. People say it takes a village to help raise students. It also takes a village to educate them. You're part of a community and we're all here together and we all care about the children and the future of the community. To support the program, visit wqln.org. ETD Photography is an Erie-based media and creative services company by Eric Dye. Creating media to expand your reach and further your goals. With a diverse project history, ETD Photography brings unique and comprehensive creative media to Erie individuals, businesses, and organizations. Services include photography, videography, web design, logos, podcast production, YouTube channel production, live streaming, and more. Check out our website at etdphotography.com. Hello, my name is Dr. Jeanette Schnars, and I'm the Executive Director of the Regional Science Consortium. And I'm here at Presque Isle State Park today exploring the priority wetlands that we've been working on with our collaborators to restore over the last decade. Now, wetlands are a critical ecosystem that help protect Lake Erie and other bodies of water that they're connected to from runoff, and that would include um, sediment in the runoff, uh, nutrients, and pollutants. And then wetlands also serve as critical habitats for all different kinds of species, including plants and insects, fish, birds, and other mammals that live here. Today we're going to investigate the relationship between humans and wetlands and how this has changed over time. So wetlands, once thought of as swamps or just pools of stagnant water that were unsightly, were often destroyed as a result of construction and development. However, today their importance is realized, and a healthy wetland exhibits high plant diversity and animal diversity. However, due to invasive species and some other human interactions, some wetlands are not considered healthy. And that's where we come in as researchers to help restore these areas. My name is Holly Best. I'm one of the assistant park managers here at Presque Isle State Park. I work with the resource management program. A large part of that program, we try to manage invasive species that are growing on the park. Some of the main targets are Phragmites and narrowleaf cattail. Phragmites are specifically important to manage because not only are they very prolific when they come into an area and take it over, they spread through rhizome, they also spread through seeds. They also are a little apathic, so they actually put poison or toxin down into the soil and prevent anything else from growing. So that makes the monoculture of that plant, which for species diversity is very detrimental. At this park, we're very fortunate that we are able to use herbicide to help control these species. We have done everything from have interns with backpack sprayers, you know, doing a very focused attempt, all the way up to helicopters actually doing kind of broadcast spraying over some of those very large monoculture areas. We're fortunate that we're able to use that as a control technique because if you don't have that ability, it's very hard to control these species and try to return these areas back to their native environments. Uh, my name is Jen Salem. I'm the horticulture specialist for the Regional Science Consortium and I'm also the founder of Go Native Erie. Go Native Erie is a program that operates under the Regional Science Consortium and it helps educate the public about the benefits of native plant species and using natives in their gardens. Native plants are actually, um, they're, they're defined in two ways. 
They are plants that were discovered here growing in North America at the time of European settlement. Um, but a better definition of that is that native plants are a plant that has been in an area for a long time and it has evolved with something else to form an important relationship. We are in the Regional Science Consortium Greenhouse at the Tom Ridge Environmental Center. So we use this for propagation. So we get things growing and started here. So this is the beginning of the process. So every year I'm looking at what seeds can I grow, what did well. Every year we're trying to increase our diversity and the amount of plants that we grow, but also pay attention to things that are going to do well. It's not just about quantity, it's also about quality. So now we're down at the Regional Science Consortium's Cold Frame Greenhouse on Presque Isle State Park. And this is used as a distribution center and holding area for all the plants that are produced in the Regional Science Consortium propagation greenhouse. So when plants uh, grow up to be a certain size and they're ready to be planted in a wetland, they are brought down here and held at this site and cared for. Then when we have groups of volunteers and employees that can come and help, we decide what plants are going into each of the restoration locations and we'll just load these all up on a truck and have a planting day. All right, so I hope you enjoyed the tour of our wetlands and all the work that we're doing with our collaborators to help restore these areas. So if you'd like to learn more about this project or other projects, please visit the Regional Science Consortium's website at www.regsciconsort.com.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. We're excited to have our evening presentation tonight. Uh, we have John Laskos and Brian Gula, which are environmental education specialists with the PA DCNR out at Presque Isle State Park. And they're going to talk to us tonight about the natural resources and management of those resources out of the park. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Go ahead. Very good. Well, I just wanted to say thank you, everybody, for joining us here tonight. Uh, we are going to talk uh, for a while about Presque Isle and Erie Bluff State Park. It's a complex uh, here at Presque Isle. And uh, all the resource management that goes on behind the scenes and, and under the public eye here at Presque Isle and Erie Bluffs. So that's the title slide that you see, and I'm going to move right along. And before we get started, we always like to make a note of our mission statement. Um, and our motto is to protect and conserve all of our natural resources for our use and the, and the use of future generations. That is the motto of the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, where Brian and I work at Presque Isle as environmental educators. So... For most of the school year, uh, we are involved with teaching children as they come out to the park with their field trips and their teachers bring them out. And then during the summer when school is out, we're involved with resource management uh, and other things like pontoon boat program, kayaking events, night hikes, um, and a whole sort of things that we're interested in drawing people out to the outdoors as a, as a way of getting healthy exercise and enjoying the, the jewel of the park that we have here at Presque Isle. Presque Isle is an important ecological area. It was, it uh, became a state park in 1921. It was the second state park in Pennsylvania behind Valley Forge State Park, which was our first state park. Presque Isle is unique in that it is about 3,200 acres. It's about five square miles, including about 500 feet out into the water. It is a peninsula. It's not quite an island. It is uh, technically known as a recurving sand spit. And it was formed about between 11 and 14,000 years ago as a result of the glacier that was retreating across the continental shelf. As the glacier melted and scoured out, depressions in the ground, which filled with the melting water and became our Great Lakes. Presque Isle is known for its beautiful uh, bird migrations that occur during the spring and in the fall. We are directly located along what is called the Atlantic Flyway, which is a path that migrating birds take and they frequently visit the Great Lakes area and Presque Isle on their migration routes. It's an important bird area, and people from all over the world come here to take part in birding events. We're well known for the vast multitude of different species of birds that have made their way here during their migrations. In 1967, Presque Isle became nationally recognized as a national natural landmark. And throughout the years, we have benefited from that designation in many ways. Um, it's become somewhat of a protected habitat. What's really unique, uh, one of the most things, one of the things that's most unique about Presque Isle is it is home to several highly endangered plant species that occur in Pennsylvania, many of which only are found at Presque Isle State Park. So a lot of our conservation efforts go towards uh, protecting them, as well as uh, you'll see during the PowerPoint, we're heavily involved with uh, invasive species removal, such as Phragmite and Oriental Bittersweet and other plants. 
And for a long time, Presque Isle State Park it has been a very highly visited uh, area in Pennsylvania. We, we, we have the only beach in Pennsylvania, if you think about it, on the southern shore of Lake Erie is the top of Erie County. And uh, that is the only beach area in the state. And within that area, that is where Presque Isle lies, right in the center just about of Erie County on the southern shore of Lake Erie. We get uh, usually on average about 4 million visitors a year come here from all over, from many different states. Our visitor logbook has logged every single state in the United States and people from about 18 other nations. So those are the people that have visited our park uh, over the course of time. I'm going to turn it over to Brian now, who's going to talk a little bit about... Uh Hi, my, my name is Brian Gula, and uh, I'm uh, also one of the educators here, and uh, I started here at Presque Isle in uh, 2001, and this park has been amazing to me. I, I've had a, uh, the opportunity to uh, participate in a lot of uh, research projects over the years and helping out a lot of the wildlife uh, here on the peninsula and uh, recently getting involved uh, really hands-on with the resource management. I also had the opportunity to really adopt and um, organize and beginning to share the park archives. Uh, this park has a strong history behind it, and there's a lot of information that uh, in the beginning, when Presque Isle became a state park in 1921, there was a, what was called the Erie Park and Harbor Commission was established to manage the peninsula and the Erie Harbor, which is the city side of Erie along the bayfront today. And as they managed the peninsula, they met monthly, and they uh, kept a great record of every monthly meeting they had, um, from the engineering projects, uh, from building the road, uh, infrastructure, uh, sand, um, erosion, the, the list goes on and on. And so... Kind of what you see, um, kind of pre -Pen uh, Presque Isle, pre State Park, there really wasn't, uh, it wasn't very accessible. Uh, prior to 1925, the only way to really reach the peninsula was uh, by boat. Uh, or when the neck was solid enough, people rode horseback onto the peninsula. And so the story really begins shortly after it becomes a state park and the development begins. And really the, the very first project that really changes Presque Isle in many ways is the road. And the road was finished in 1926 and it only ended in the waterworks area. They then uh, got the funding and extended the road and started doing the work in 1927. And by 1930, they had a complete road that went all the way around the peninsula. And you can still see evidence and remnants of that original road. And what's always fascinating when I talk to people about this is that original road that went all the way around the peninsula was on the north side of the lighthouse. 
And of course, it's not there today. <laughs> uh, the, the lake is there. <laughs> A big storm in 1946 took out that road, which led to the road that we travel on today. But if you look at this picture on the left and the slide, um, there's a Erie Park and Harbor Commission report. In 1938, uh, the park was receiving approximately 3.8 million visitors in 1938. So that road changed everything. And also in those early years, the thought processes of uh, conservation uh, was a little different. Um, you'll see a lot of terminology used in those early newspaper articles throughout the 30s. Uh, when they were developing the park, they would refer to it as beautification. They would beautify the peninsula. So that meant a lot of cutting of things, removing of things, um, so that they had views of the bay side and the lake side, and also planting. Uh, we have uh, some neat uh, letters from local garden clubs that were working with the Park and Harbor Commission at the time uh, to plant lilacs and lilies and, and those kinds of things, and all of those roadside and infrastructure areas. Uh, Waterworks Park um, was one of the first areas on the peninsula that really got developed and was beautified. And there was even a sawmill in that location that they cut a lot of the trees to use uh, for the infrastructure. The three cabins around the two pond, uh, around the west pond uh, was built by a lot of the trees on the peninsula at the time. Um, in the early days, the picnic tables and a lot of the other buildings, uh, the pit latrine uh, restrooms uh, were all basically utilized right here on the peninsula. And at one point there were two sawmills, one at the maintenance area and one at waterworks. And another big story, so, with all these folks now having more access to the peninsula, you know, they were bringing with them a lot of different things. And in the 1950s, um, you know, with the entire lake shore uh, being what it is, sand, and the strong winds and the movement of Lake Erie constantly moving that material around, there was a lot of erosion that they were dealing with. So if you kind of look at the photographs on the right-hand side, um, those photographs are from the 1960s. <clears throat> the top photograph is 1960, and the bottom photograph is 1961. And what you're seeing in the top photograph is Beach 6. When you look at Beach 6 today, it's not going to look like this at all. And why this is so wide and there's so much sand um, in this location, in this photograph of 1960, is because of a project that the Park and Harbor Commission, along with the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, decided to dredge out uh, an area on the park that was called uh, the State Pond Area. And today it is the Presque Isle Marina. So the Presque Isle Marina um, is man-made. It was dredged out. And the dredging vessel, uh, as it was dredging the material out of that wetland, uh, they ran a pipeline and they pumped all of that material, which turns out to be about 3 million cubic yards of material, down to the neck, up to Beach 6, both on the lakeside and the bayside. So they really widened the neck of the peninsula um, throughout the uh, late mid to late 1950s. And... In the 1960s, these beaches became incredibly popular. And 
Uh, there were some numbers in the four millions in the 1960s, uh, and we still average those types of numbers today. Also, something that's kind of unique is an area just east of what's called the Public Safety Building. Uh, some of you may know it if you are familiar with the peninsula. On the Presque Isle map, it is identified as the ball field area. That was an originally a ball field that was made by the uh, Park and Harbor Commission in the 1930s, in the late 1930s. And they didn't like the sand material, the wetland material that was there uh, for a ball field. So there was a project, um, a construction project, kind of over by uh, the lower part of Peach Street back in those days. And they utilized all of that fill material from that project transported over to the peninsula and filled up the ball field area with that dirt, that soil material, and created a ball diamond. So there in, our, in the peninsula's past, there has been a lot of displacement, a lot of material moved from one place to another. The entire lagoon system, that if you've ever kayaked in the lagoon, again, that was man-made. Uh, those were individual ponds, and in 1914, the Fish and Boat Commission had ownership of those ponds, and they dredged a channel from Misery Bay into Graveyard Pond, through Big Pond, into Long Pond, and then eventually into the backside of the marina, which is a very popular kayaking route for folks to enjoy today. But that was originally done... Um, the Fish Commission had thoughts to build a very large um, nursery waters and raise fish for the commercial fishing industry that was going on at that time. Also, to get the public to, to support their project, they told the public that they were going to take all of the material that they, that they dredged out from the lagoon and fill in all of the nearby wetlands to eradicate the mosquito population. And it worked. Everyone said, go ahead, let's do it. <laughs> um, so uh, a lot of the things that we are dealing with today, um, you can really trace back to the past and the history, the very rich history that we have here on the peninsula. And uh, just recently, in 2004, we acquired another piece of property west of Presque Isle, which is known as the Erie Bluff State Park, uh, which uh, encompasses uh, 587 acres. And it's, it was one of the last undeveloped locations uh, along the Erie County, Lake Erie coastline. Uh, that we could manage and keep open for the public to enjoy. But also, it offers some very unique habitats, uh, very different from Presque Isle. Uh, we, there are bluffs and cliffs there that are uh, 90 feet straight up from Lake Erie with amazing views and, of course, a very unique um, ecosystem and a lot of different species of plants that are growing along those bluff edges and species of birds such as bank swallows that are utilizing uh, that material uh, for nesting purposes. It, it's, it's an amazing place. Um, we have active bald eagle nests at the Erie Bluffs. Again, uh, uh, it's a very good birding location. Lots of raptors are seen uh, flying through there. Uh, we see a lot of merlins. Um, and a lot of different species of hawks in the spring. And it's a unique area because it's very primitive. There really isn't any infrastructure at the Erie Bluffs. Um, so it's a great place to go for a walk and really not run into any sign of civilization. Um, except you will hear the train. The train is nearby about every 15 minutes. <laughs> But uh, 
what's unique because of the terrain, we have some amazing species of trees in its property. Some of the uh, older Climax Forest trees, uh, there's actually several trees on this property that are uh, what would be called state contenders for their species. And also because of the natural uh, geological movements, uh, there's an area on the property that is an ancient sand dune as that lake was receding back and offers a unique habitat which is called a black oak savanna. And so there's really not a whole lot of places that you can visit in the state of Pennsylvania and encounter uh, these special and very unique types of habitats um, like the Erie Bluffs. All right. Elaborate a little bit on some of uh, the species that we get a chance to get involved with here at Prescott. I am back. Um, there are many different species. Some of them are birds. Some of them are plants. Some of them are animals. Um, and it really leads to why Presque Isle is a unique habitat. We manage several different types of plants. And the natural area at the far tip of Presque Isle is referred to as Gull Point. It's an area of the park that is the most dynamic and most changing. See, as we get weather, uh, wind usually comes from the west, and that plays a critical role in the formation of the park. As the wind and waves strike the park from the west, it scours out the sand. The longshore current then carries that sediment to the far end at Gull Point, and uh, it's deposited there as the water slows down. As the currents wrap around the tip, uh, new fingers and formations are formed constantly, and it's, it looks different year after year. Uh, it changes all the time. What, what makes Gull Point so valuable uh, in many ways is the fact that it's a preferred habitat for species like the piping plover and the common tern who are frequently found uh, at Gull Point and in the hopes of they will stay there and create a nest. And I think in, the, in all of the Great Lakes area, uh, last year and the year before, only 10 active nests of the piping plover were recorded, one of which was at Presque Isle. So when this happens, a lot of things get set into play. Federal protection rules apply, and we, they really go out of their way to make sure that these animals are not disturbed. And there has been a lot of success uh, with animals like the plover. Um, just recently, the one pair of plovers were able to fledge a few chicks out of their nest, and they were captured and banded and recorded uh, for future records, and the nest was deemed successful. Other creatures, such as the Blandings turtle, are also found at Presque Isle. This is an ideal habitat for that type of turtle. Um, and in the past couple of years, the, the Fish and Boat Commission had made efforts to capture some of these turtles and affix radio transponders to their shells to track their movements. And when these turtles are caught, they are specially marked by cutting notches in their shell to determine, you know, so in the future, if the same turtle is caught, they'll know that this is the same turtle. 
And as far as they can tell, there's only been four, four individuals of these turtles ever caught here. So they're still looking and they're hopeful that they'll find more. Several species of plant, like I said, are also uh, managed here, such as the lupine and the hairy pacoon, and things like Phragmite. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit further down the PowerPoint, but the reason that we manage these invasive plants uh, is because if they were left to go unchecked, they would create what is called a monoculture, and they would grow to the point where they crowd out the native vegetation, and that's something we don't want to see. We want to see a lot of biodiversity with many different species of plants in the ecosystem to create many different types of habitat for many different types of animals. Other types of species that we monitor and protect are the bluebird. Uh, we maintain uh, a series of about 15 or 16 bluebird nest boxes at the Erie Bluff State Park. And here at Presque Isle in recent years, we've really been paying attention to some bank swallow activity. Uh, as the beach erodes and the sand slumps down into the water, it creates these mini little cliffs, which these birds will hollow out uh, holes in these cliffs to make nests. And of course, when we see that happening uh, during periods of beach sand replenishment, some people uh, are notified, and then, of course, sand replenishment must stop in that area until the birds have finished nesting uh, for the sand replenishment to continue. Um, these birds uh, figured out a way to make these little cliffs their home, so we have to abide by that and make sure that they are protected. Many different things happen at Presque Isle State Park. Along with all the public education that happens, the school programs that we put on throughout the year, Presque Isle is a favorite spot for many people for many different reasons. And the pictures on this slide kind of show that. It's quite common in the summertime to go to uh, Sunset Beach and the uh, Beach 10 area uh, it becomes a very crowded beach with many, many different kite flyers attending there. Uh, large gatherings with a, a gentleman named Lee who brings out his bubble makers a lot. Uh, they do the polar challenge, the polar ice plunge out here. The lagoons are a favorite spot for kayaking and canoeing and bass fishing the multi-purpose path that goes around the entire perimeter of the park is popular for skateboarders, uh, roller skaters, bicyclists, joggers, hikers, and even in the winter time, uh, we use the two ponds at the waterworks for ice fishing, as well as on Misery Bay. So these are all valuable resources that need management uh, so that they are preserved for future generations to enjoy and to also make sure that uh, they don't go away. We want these activities to be available all the time year-round. Presque Isle is open year-round, 12 months out of the year for uh, outdoor activities. Some of the main invasive species targets that we, that we go after out here at the park are garlic mustard, honeysuckle, oriental bittersweet, Japanese knotweed, the narrow-leaved cattail, phragmite, purple loosestrife, and flowering rush, and elanthus trees, which are, uh, is the tree of heaven variety. And if we didn't go after these, uh, these certain species, like I said, they would eventually take over and choke out native vegetation. And then we wouldn't have uh, a diverse park that is as beautiful as it is today.
we like to follow best management practices. And that means we protect the best of what we have, preserving special habitats. And species like pacoon, lupine, prickly pear, and a native phragmite, um, these are all part of the program. Uh, and the reason we go after uh, every year, probably uh, the most heavily we go after these, some of these aquatic invasive species is in about the August to early September time frame. Um, typically, we have a, a group of hired interns who will go out on the park with their backpack sprayers and they will attack the, the heaviest areas of the park that could not be reached by helicopter. And we refer to it as peeling back the layers, kind of like how you peel an onion. And as you peel an onion, you get to all these different layers. It would be unfeasible, if not impossible, to get rid of everything all at once. So the best we can do is attack it year by year and push it back keep pushing it back until we're finally to the point that we need to be. And we have a lot of different tools to help us out in that regard. Um, like I said in the beginning, uh, the helicopter sprayer came and took care of the large chunks of land, uh, 100 or more acres, uh, aerial spraying. And then the interns uh, continue the attack on foot they, uh, under the, the authority of a licensed application uh, sprayer, uh, following very special and highly detailed safety guidelines. We've also used uh, our pontoon boat as a, a floating mobile spraying platform, as well as utility vehicles like the Gator and other ATVs that can mount spraying equipment on it. And we use this equipment to head out into the field and continue the attack year by year. And here's an up-close photo of the uh, helicopter that came. Uh, that's its portable landing platform where it is refueled and restocked with uh, herbicide. It, uh, the pilot is well trained at this. This is a Bell Jet Ranger helicopter, a very a very airworthy airframe and it's capable of maneuvering very low to the ground in tight situations to get that applicator, get that chemical out where it needs to be sprayed. And then several years ago, through uh, with generous uh, donation from Ducks Unlimited, uh, these funds were able to allow us to purchase an airboat which took us even further into the field to get places that the pontoon boat couldn't reach. Now this is a pretty powerful tool and uh, a few of us were trained how to use it. It's about a 500 horsepower uh, engine on board which uh, this thing goes right over the top of uh, these tall reeds into places where the pontoon boat couldn't get. And it has a portable tank on board that allows us to put the chemical where we need it. And it allowed us to be much more precise <clears throat> and reach areas of the park that we couldn't previously get to. I'm going to turn it back to Brian now, who's going to talk more about uh, what goes on behind the scenes here. All right, great. <clears throat> Um, again, this, uh, uh, this effort, uh, getting an opportunity to, uh, see what it looked like before, um, really the effort on the ground started. Um, yeah, I started it at the peninsula in 2001 and, you know, ma managing the pontoon boat program. And, uh, I kind of got a chance to see firsthand a lot of our wetlands on the peninsula, uh, really being threatened by the growth of some of these invasive species, such as the narrow leaf cattail, the phragmites, the purple loosestrife, and a few others. And again, as we were seeing that happening, you know, you, you started seeing a decrease in um, the diversity of wildlife. 
Um, it was even becoming such a, an issue for recreation to occur in a lot of these areas. And Presque Isle has always been a story of balancing um, the natural resources, the accessibility to the public, um, and, and the wide range of, of, of unique habitats that we have here. And so um, when you're kind of looking at this slide here, when you're looking at the map on the left side, uh, the red areas are the areas that we have um, up to this point um, effectively have treated. And these areas were pretty much consumed. Um, some of these wetland areas were really nothing but Phragmites or, not, or narrow leaf. Um, even the wildlife, you didn't find much wildlife in these areas. And we're really into our um, sixth year of really strong um, attempts on you know, peeling those layers back like an onion, and we have seen some tremendous results. Uh, one of the things that uh, I have had the opportunity to witness, uh, there was no records of osprey nesting on the peninsula. Um, in the mid-80s, they put up several osprey platforms, but they never got used. And just recently, last year, was the first year that we had osprey uh, build a nest on the peninsula. And uh, it was successful. So this was tremendous. This was great news. And this year, we had two <clears throat> separate osprey pairs that have built nests. One was successful and the other one wasn't, but definitely an increase. And something else that we have noticed too, especially in a lot of the wetland areas that have been treated and got that frag and narrow leaf cut back, we're seeing a lot of the native species of aquatic plants coming back and also a lot of different species utilizing it like the great blue herons, turtles, um, great egrets. Um, and, and I really think opening up those areas could be uh, possibly why the ospreys have decided to nest here. Um, these are great shallow areas for them to hunt. And when that frag was consuming those areas, that they really couldn't utilize those areas to hunt in. And uh, there's some other factors too, like uh, the last few years, uh, the Lake Erie water levels have risen. Um, we were at record high uh, water levels this year. Um, so that has been, um, you know, had a very interesting impact, uh, both positive and negative um, here on the peninsula. Uh, but we're uh, seeing um, in the wetland areas, least bitterns. Uh, there's a lot more least bitterns that we're encountering in these areas that uh, we were able to reduce the number of frag and narrow leaf and get back to the native species like the Burr Reed wetland. And when they originally identified these habitat areas, that's what they called a lot of the wetlands here on Presque Isle was a Burr Reed wetland. So in uh, 2020, uh, the work completed by the uh, environmental education staff uh, with license applicator um, is showed in the orange on the slide. Uh, this was kind of the uh, area that we were concentrating on this year. Um, and of course, uh, this has been a unique and historical year, as everybody knows, with COVID. Uh, we have uh, definitely had to um, increase our safety policies and, uh, you know, really look out for one another, um, but still, you know, try to do what we want to do and protect and conserve Presque Isle. Um, we did not have the intern help this year. 
uh, like we have in the past. And so uh, my hat goes off to all the folks, uh, the education team, um, for getting out there and, uh, you know, really uh, working with uh, limited resources. But uh, we still managed to get a lot of areas, um, hopefully, uh, it, this was a good success this year. And uh, this is really what we're doing it for. Um, when I first started here at the peninsula, um, operating the pontoon boat and the volunteer program, uh, the lagoons looked like this on the left. It was pretty much nothing but frag, um, kind of in those mid-2000s. And the uh, photograph on the right is the same area. Um, this is an area over by Beach 10. Um, and uh, this is a very unique wetland habitat. Uh, this uh, originally was a new pond that was formed shortly after 1899. And through natural succession, uh, all of these wonderful wetland species uh, have taken um, residence in this area and this is an awesome place to see a variety of waterfowl, wading birds, great blue herons, turtles, frogs, fish, uh, you name it. <clears throat> uh, and something else that was really exciting last year, um, last winter, right in this same area we had otter tracks <laughs> right in the snow and you know, we've only had maybe a few otter sightings at the peninsula uh, since the time I've been here. And uh, we're hopeful that a species like that uh, may uh, call Prescott home and set up a residence. So with that being said, when you go from left to right, I think you are going to see the benefits. And it all comes down to keeping that biodiversity. That's what you need for a healthy system. And I'm going to turn it over to John again to focus on a few more things. Uh, we are blessed to have a staff uh, headed up by Jen here who has taken the lead on propagating a lot of native plants that are used to restore uh, certain areas on the park. A lot of time is spent propagating these plants in the greenhouse here at the trek as well as in an area on the park. And many volunteers also donate their time and effort uh, reestablishing areas on the park with native plants. Um, a large volunteer effort is, is needed. And there's a lot of areas on the park that are in need of restoration, and it's a time-consuming job. And we're, we're just glad to have dedicated staff here like Jen, who spends a lot of time making sure that Skya looks the way it's supposed to look. Here's another example. You, know, you can't really uh, tell by looking at it, but the photo on the left is an area in a wetland area that uh, pre-treatment uh, and on the right is some plants that have been transplanted and with a little bit of luck and uh, a little bit of uh, good fortune uh, they'll take off and they will help establish a diverse ecosystem and uh, prevent us from having a monoculture which is what we don't want. A lot of partnerships go into all of this work. It's not just DCNR uh, by ourselves. We couldn't do it uh, by ourselves. Uh, we, we get a lot of uh, funding from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Uh, Ducks Unlimited administers a lot of the money that we use for our grants for uh, combating invasive species. And RSC, the Research Science Consortium, in partnership with the California University of Pennsylvania, monitors a lot of these plants, amphibians, and reptiles, and also makes sure that the water quality parameters are uh, in, in good check. Go Native Erie, 
was founded and is managed by Jen Salem. And like I said, she propagates natives and reestablishes their presence where needed on the park. We get help from the Erie Bird Observatory, uh, monitoring bird populations and migrating birds, especially when they establish a nest here on the park. Uh, Environment Erie, uh, they, at one point they had a group called the Weed Warriors, a volunteer crew that would go out and combat garlic mustard, oriental bittersweet, and a lot of the uh, fast growing ground cover plants that we were trying to get rid of on the park. Recently, uh, myself and two co-workers were trained by the Forestry Department of Pennsylvania to conduct prescribed fires, controlled burns in areas where they might be needed. Uh, this is an effective way to uh, manage certain areas of the park. Um, when a lot of people, when you think of a fire, you think of something that goes crazily out of control, but a controlled burn is actually a very careful, methodical approach to eliminating some of these species. And actually, once an area has been burned, it's ideal habitat for some of these native seeds to come forth again and, and re-sprout and, and uh, repopulate an area of the park. This is what you don't want to see. This is what's happening out west in California, Nevada. Uh, this is an uncontrolled burn that quickly devastates hundreds of thousands of acres and displaces many people from their homes. This is terrible. This is not what you want to see. Uh, you, you really want to manage a controlled burn using, using uh, very strict rules and regulations so that it doesn't get out of control and, and wind up being a fire like this. Uh, controlled burns are a critical and cost-effective management tool that uh, enables Pennsylvania's forests and wildlife to thrive. Uh, when used correctly, it does reduce the impact of wildfire hazards, which is especially important in Pennsylvania due to the large amount of land in the wildland areas and the interfaces, and it really protects important areas such as the old growth climax forests like in Cook Forest. It's relatively inexpensive to conduct controlled burns. Uh, a study was done several years ago uh, on a 20 acre field and they found that um, in one year of management it cost four thousand dollars to brush hog uh, a 20 acre field Considering that you had to pay the operator for his time, you had to pay for fuel and maintenance on the on the equipment. But it only cost six hundred dollars uh, to do a controlled burn, and that was assuming three hours and eight staff at twenty five dollars an hour. And it it multiplies uh, in effect over the course of years, and it shows that the fifteen year cost. Uh, was even more cost effective. So it's even more cost effective the longer your management plan is in effect uh, by doing controlled fires versus mechanical means. Studies have also shown that uh, ticks are relatively well controlled by fire. And this isn't one of the primary reasons why we do a fire, but, but more of a, um, a nice benefit, a nice added benefit of controlled burns is reducing the number of ticks by up to 88% after a burn. And not only are they controlled in the year that we con conduct the fire, but for several years after the fire, the percentages are uh, far lower than if you did a mechanical removal with a brush hog. Um, because ticks, uh, they like to lay in wait. They can sense heat. They They will put their front legs out as feelers, and when they sense heat nearby, they will drop off the vegetation onto their host. And so without that vegetation, uh, that interrupts their life cycle and they can't survive. So that's why they found out that uh, control burns also controls ticks pretty well. Um, like I just said, long-term prescribed fire reduces tick uh, populations regardless of how long you burned and regardless of how many ticks there were or, or regardless of what type of vegetation. And that's because uh, 
when you remove vegetation, you create that environment, uh, you allow it to become a little bit hotter and drier, which is not an ideal habitat for ticks. And because you reduce the tick population, you also reduce the disease risk for humans. Uh, everybody knows that ticks are now carrying Lyme disease, ehrlichiosis, babyosis, and other disease. And we're even uh, playing host to a brand new tick species, which I forget the name of, but uh, we do have another tick species to worry about now in our area. So that makes it even uh, more reason to conduct controlled burns. Uh, uh, but we have to wait for specific conditions. We can't, the wind just has to be right. It has to be the right kind of weather. There's a lot of safety involved. And, um, but if you have all those parameters in line and you conduct a controlled burn, the results are going to be favored. Brian talked a little bit earlier about Erie's, uh, Lake Erie's record water levels. They play uh, a, a role in uh, managing the ecosystem. They, for one thing, high water levels make it much harder to do a lot of the work. You can see in this photo here uh, on the upper left, Long Pond Trail, along with many other trails, are, have been underwater and some areas impassable. High water leads to uh, a lot of the shallow rooted trees being susceptible to falling over like cottonwoods and black locust trees. There was even a point in time where high water levels, as in the lower right picture, had stranded uh, quite a few numbers of carp on the inland areas of the lagoon area. And uh, co-workers and I had to spend better part of a day or two uh, scooping up all these carp and throwing them back over that temporary fence into the deeper waters where they belong. Uh, if we didn't do that, uh, the waters would have receded and then uh, we'd have been getting a lot of complaints from the public about smelly fish fouling up their favorite picking, picnic areas. Uh, so the high water levels have really added a lot of complications to our efforts, but they haven't quite stopped us entirely. In the spring, long, right about March, is when uh, co-workers uh, Ray will take volunteers out, uh, especially with the new airboat, and begin controlling or making efforts to control the Canada goose population. Now, we've had a lot of trouble in recent years with people wanting to feed Canada geese. They, they like to feed them potato chips and bread and Cheerios and crackers. So we've been taking a lot of time to inform the public that that's not a good thing to do. They don't get their nutrition from such food. And in March is a good time when they, they can begin to nest in early March. So what we do is we use this airboat uh, to visit the nests as we find them. And if there's eggs, the eggs are coated with a vegetable oil which seals up the pores in the eggs and will prevent the developing fetus from further developing. This is considered one of the more humane ways of controlling the Canada goose population. So every week for about seven or eight weeks, we'll visit that same nest, recoat the eggs, and that tricks the hen into staying on the nest. And after about seven or eight weeks, the nest is then removed or destroyed and at that time, the hen will not have the biological energy needed to lay more eggs. So tricking her to stay on an unproductive nest instead of going to lay more eggs elsewhere, very effective tool. Uh, not every year we have a chance to do this. We were doing it with the pontoon boat. It requires uh, more than one person, one person to, co to coat the eggs and one or two people to fend off angry male uh, goose who will come after you trying to protect his nest. The airboat not only made it easier to get to the nest, but when the goose sees this airboat coming, they're, they're deathly afraid of it. They just take off. They don't put up a fight when they see that boat coming. So that's been a very effective tool in the managing of the Canada goose population. 
I'm going to turn it over to Brian, who has special personal knowledge of some of this uh, bird nesting programs, and he can fill you in better than I could. So DCNR is very proactive um, uh, throughout the state of Pennsylvania in conserving uh, bluebird habitat. And um, there's, uh, this is a great opportunity for volunteers to get involved. Uh, we have a lot of um, opportunities for scout groups and, 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 and um, other groups like that to really get involved with some citizen science. And uh, the Erie Bluffs uh, has been uh, our location for our bluebird nest boxes. Um, that habitat is unique. When we first acquired the land, it was uh, uh, being farmed uh, by a local farmer uh, that was leasing the land. And then those farms were transitioned over time uh, back to a natural state. And during this successional stage of those fields, uh, coming back with a variety of uh, prairie-like species, grassland-like species, uh, this really uh, has been prime habitat for bluebirds. Um, we have about 16 boxes uh, throughout the uh, Erie Bluffs location. Um, and it's really a lot of fun to uh, put up these structures and um, visit them on a weekly uh, basis, uh, sometimes a couple days a week. And you, we uh, record how many eggs are in the nest and uh, report that information, how successful uh, the, the bluebirds are uh, utilizing um, this area. And uh, each year is a little different. Um, weather plays a major role. Um, whether you, it's a mild winter or early spring or cold, uh, these last couple of years, a lot of this up and down type of cold and hot, cold and hot, cold and hot type of uh, weather patterns that we seem to have has put a little <coughs> little hindrance on the success rate of the bluebirds this year. Uh, but a couple years ago, we almost had about 95% success rate. So um, a lot of that is uh, weather driven. And it just goes to... Um, really the, the variety of uh, resources that we have uh, between Presque Isle um, and the Bluffs, uh, trying to utilize all the information we have and the tools that we have and really try to meet our mission um, with the public and, and share our knowledge and educate folks how important it is to protect and conserve our natural resources so all of our future generations have the same opportunities that we have now. And there's nothing better to turn someone into an environmental steward than by having a young child or even an adult uh, to be active and participate in a project like this and to see that success and to help, um, you know, see the structure that we provide and the success of these birds uh, propagating and continuing the resources down the road. So uh, with that being said, um, uh, John and I will kind of uh, conclude this and, and leave some time for any uh, questions you may have of the park, uh, some of our uh, resource management efforts. Um, but even general questions, feel free to ask us uh, anything about the park, history, um, some of the resources uh, that we have currently, and even some of the challenges that you know we're facing today. So uh, we'll end there and we'll open it up for questioning. Hi, John. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Oh, good. Glad you liked it. Yeah, thank you. We were wondering if you could update us on any upcoming 
uh, programs that you might have, especially with um, the COVID pandemic situation, how you're doing those programs, if you are offering them? Yeah, so early on when we came back to work in May, uh, DC and our management realized the seriousness of the problem and they really gave us individual options as to what we wanted to do. Did we want to offer in-person programming or did we want to do virtual programming? I personally am sticking with virtual programming for a while, um, but Brian and Ray do continue to offer programs like night hikes and they, they just recently did an archery program. With uh, And every time we do an in-person uh, program, we have to file a, a COVID mitigation plan that is strictly adhered to for our safety as well as the public. So I do have uh, uh, several programs uh, coming up virtually uh, that can be found by visiting uh, the park, uh, the DCNR calendar. If anyone is interested in finding out about those programs, they can always call the park to find out when they're happening. I typically do my virtual programs on a Friday at 1 o'clock. Um, I got one coming up on the Birds of Presque Isle on the 13th of November. I have a homeschool program on the 14th on a Saturday. And then in December, I'm doing one on the Praying Mantis and a couple other ones. I can't remember all their titles. But uh, they're, they're in the works. They're, we we uh, had been using Skype, but we are making the switch. I think we decided to switch to Microsoft Teams platform. Uh, Skype has been rather glitchy lately, and we've been experimenting with Microsoft Teams, which is proving to be a good platform. So if you want to know what's going to be happening, you can always call the park office. Great. We do have a comment in our chat box. Oh, great. Um, this was very informative, and thank you very much. So the talk was very, uh, very much appreciated. Okay, great. We also have another question. Um, what is your favorite part? Um, I, it's for both of you. What is your favorite part about your job? My favorite part about my job is the sheer variety of things that we get to do. Uh, not only do we get to do in-person or school programming during the year where we get a chance to make sure kids appreciate uh, nature, but also <clears throat> kind of the free reign that we're given as far as choosing what programs we want to do when school is out. Uh, like. When I first started here, I, I began doing a uh, moonlight kayak tour in the lagoons, which was a big hit. And I remember the first time we did it, there was a beaver out there who, who, who was obviously not used to people being out there. So he followed the tail kayak uh, gentleman and kept splashing the guy with his tail. And by the time we were done, that guy was soaking wet. Uh, but he wasn't mad because he had a cool story to tell. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Brian can fill you in on what his favorite part is. Uh, that's a um, I've had a lot of unique experiences here um, at the peninsula. Um, but for me, I think it's the opportunity to help a lot of the local um, universities and folks who are doing research projects on the, on the, on the park. Uh, sometimes um, they'll look to us to kind of show them certain areas uh, of, of what, what they're interested in. Um, but one of my favorites, a couple years ago, um, there was a research project being done on the coyotes. And so I had an opportunity to go um, with a student from Edinburgh. Uh, she uh, got permits to put radio collars on uh, coyotes. And... Uh, after a long time of trying to get one, uh, she finally got one in the trap. And there was a whole group of people, uh, and uh, a lot of folks were kind of sort of timid and scared of what to do. And the girl had a, um, a, a noose, a pole, and she was looking around. She's like, I need someone to walk up and, and put this noose over this coyote uh, so we can get it out of the trap. And, and uh, I just reached over, grabbed the noose, and said, let's go. And um, so I, there I am with my hands on a live coyote um, and, and, and getting an opportunity to look them 
literally inches uh, into his eyes um, and, and getting a radio caller on him and, and really learning a lot of amazing information. We're able to track that coyote for three years and really learn a lot. Um, and those are the kind of things, as an educator, sharing those stories to to folks. I mean, coyotes are definitely one of those animals that are controversial. Uh, sometimes there's a hatred for them. And when you can, you know, share, you know, the real true, you know, the reality of our outdoors, uh, of, of, of our earth, you know, what really happens? What is the benefit? You know, how does this coyote benefit us? And uh, for me, that's the best part of the job. Great. Thank you so much. We have a couple more comments in our chat. Um, great presentation, guys, and awesome talk. Glad to see more detail into all of the projects that you're part of. Um, how are you managing bluff erosion at Erie Bluffs? Um, currently, um, at, at the Erie Bluffs, we're, we're really not doing a whole lot on the bluff erosion. Um, and part of that reason is, uh, and why that is kind of an issue in a, um, a lot of un, or a lot of developed areas, uh, private areas that have homes and infrastructures and things like that. One of the things that happened early on in, in the development of the Erie County shoreline, and again, sometimes I think it's just human nature, is when they built houses and bought property close to the shoreline, they wanted to clear those areas out to have a view. And unfortunately, when uh, you take away that vegetation and those trees, everything that's holding that bluff together, uh, you're going to see an increase in that erosion. So really, uh, the whole stretch of Erie Bluffs, uh, there really isn't much of an issue of bluff erosion. And it is actually a natural process. And it's actually an important process because all of the material that erodes from the bluff and ends up in Lake Erie is future material that's feeding Presque Isle. So it is all a complete cycle. Thank you. We have a couple more questions. Um, another comment. I wish I got to work with coyotes. So maybe there are some future graduate students that'll pursue that same research topic. Um, when will you be resuming hikes for the public? We just started resuming. Um, uh, we offered two uh, night programs <clears throat> uh, in October. We had one on October 27th and October 29th. We had one here at Presque Isle, and then we did one out at the Erie Bluffs. So uh, check out our website, the DCNR website, the, the calendar of events. Uh, we're going to be doing another uh, night hike in the month of uh, December, uh, or November and also December. We have another question for you. What is the blue heron population on Presque Isle? Very abundant, <laughs> very abundant. Um, uh, great blue herons, it's pretty neat. Um, the unique thing about great blue herons is that they utilize Presque Isle as a feeding ground. Uh, the wetlands, the variety of wetlands that we have on the peninsula. Um, so the herons aren't really nesting here. Um, herons will go to other locations and they'll actually nest in what's called a rookery. They'll find a giant tree that can hold sometimes up to 15 nests in one single tree. Um, great blue herons will all nest together in separate nests in that one tree. And I've seen, uh, right now is a great time to drive around the peninsula, stop by some of the wetlands. You may see four or five, uh, uh, great blue herons, uh, you know, with their necks stretched out, uh, trying to catch a fish right now. Um, but also, you may actually get a chance to see the great egret, which is all pure white. And they're mixed in with the great blue herons right now. So um, it, the great blue heron activity kind of picks up in the spring, kind of tailors out a little bit during the summertime, and then it picks back up here 
um, last couple weeks, it's it's really been getting uh, a lot of traffic with great blue herons, and that'll continue until uh, really the snow starts falling. Okay, another question for you. As we enter the fall and winter season, what are some things that visitors can look for at the park? Uh, th this is a great time of year. Um, as these fall storms are playing a role, uh, there's a lot of unique bird migration. Waterfowl is great right now. Um, I'm hoping that we have a cold fall and winter. Uh, we really need that ice this year. Uh, we need our bay to freeze over. We need the lake, lake Erie to freeze over. Uh, a unique thing, a unique thing happens in the winter time. If, if it gets cold enough, the shoreline freezes up and those waves crash in and form these ice dunes along the entire shoreline of the peninsula. And that protects and kind of holds and stops that erosion for as long as those ice dunes are there. Um, and it's just a sight to see. But as that's occurring, keep this in mind, when things are starting to freeze up, there are certain areas of the park that freeze faster than others. Uh, the channel, the north and south pier, there's a lot of current that comes in and out of there. So that stays open longer. And when that happens, when the rest of the bay freezes over and you still have areas of open water, I've seen 80,000 to 100,000 uh, different t species of waterfowl congregating in those open areas. It can be absolutely amazing to see. So keep that in mind. Okay. Is it scary walking at the bluffs during hunting? Is there any chance of making some of the trail areas hunt free? Well, uh, the, we basically treat the Erie Bluffs very similar to uh, Pennsylvania game lands. And uh, hunting is a very good management tool. Uh, and also, uh, something that uh, <clears throat> we have kind of learned to live with as well, for folks who like to recreate during uh, the hunting season, you know, most of the hunters are going to be back in these kind of remote areas and kind of staying off the main part of the trail because they don't want other visitors, you know, to maybe stir up the animals or whatnot. So uh, we never really run into too many problems. Um, just remember, uh, if you are going to recreate in an area that you know hunting is occurring, to wear an uh, orange hat, uh, maybe a little orange vest, and you can still do all the things that you normally would do on a trail. Okay, another question for you. Where is the best spot or time to see a bittern? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, and one of the things that John mentioned earlier, one of the reasons why we don't start spraying until August is because that's after the nesting season. So your best chance of seeing uh, bitterns is in the spring when they are kind of establishing their areas on the peninsula. So uh, the month of April is a great time to kind of kayak through the lagoon. Uh, you may get a chance to see uh, Big Pond is a very good area to see bitterns. Um, that's where we've been seeing uh, a, a large amount of them with the uh, restoration work that's been going on. And uh, the month of May as well. Uh, you get you'll you'll see them a little bit more toward the end of the fall, but by now most of them have moved south. So um, I would uh, kind of focus on that springtime uh, for your best chance to see them. And we have one last question before we let you guys go. Have you guys seen any loons yet? Are they here, or is it too early? We haven't started seeing the loons yet. Um, Usually that tends to occur uh, more toward the later part of November as those winter storms start getting a little more intense. Uh, so right now it's kind of mild. So we need those temperatures to drop. We need those winds to pick up and we'll start seeing more activity.
Sounds good. Well, it sounds like there's a lot going on at Presque Isle State Park year round, not just in the um, spring or summer, but it sounds like there's a lot to do right now as well. Yeah, the fall and the winter time is by far one of the, one of my favorite times out here on the peninsula. Uh, you get a little bit of snow on the ground, and you uh, you know, walking on the beach or on a trail in the in the, in the woods, uh, you, you'll see what's in your area. Uh, a lot of tracks in the snow. Um, it's just a great time to be out. Well, thank you guys so much. I appreciate your time this evening and being part of the RSC symposium. I think you provided a lot of valuable information and um, just wanted to update everybody that's out there. We will be back online tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. for a full morning of talks. And then after lunch, we'll have our student awards and conclude the symposium. And thank you, John. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Well, thank you. It was uh, an honor for us to uh, talk to everybody tonight. And I hope to see uh, everyone at our programs. And hopefully, as COVID uh, starts to lift, uh, we'll be able to uh, do more in-person things and in larger groups again and just have those awesome outdoor encounters. So thanks a lot, everybody. And everyone have a great evening and enjoy the outdoors.